Değerli meslektaşlarım, değerli arkadaşlarım, e, webinarlara iki ay kadar yaz tatili dolayısıyla ara verdik. Diğer e, yayın organları gibi biz de Eylül başında hem kalan programımıza devam edeceğiz hem de iki, üç tane eksik webinarımız var. Onları da Eylül ve Ekim'de kongremize kadar tamamlamış olacağız. E, biliyorsunuz 28-31 Ekim'de e, çok geniş, kapsamlı bir kongre hazırlandı. Bilimsel programı sizlere sunduk. Yüzde seksenden fazla kendi alanında e, otorite olmuş yabancı konuşmacılarla sizleri buluşturacağız. Lütfen takvimlerinizi, planlarınızı ona göre ayırın. Üç gün dolu dolu bir kongre olacak. E, bu akşamki webinar konumuz <gülüyor> mozaik embriyolarla ilgili olacak. Bu mozaik embriyolarda e, hepimiz klinik olarak e, birçok şeylerle karşılaşıyoruz. Nelerle karşılaşıyoruz? Bir tanesi acaba bunu yapalım mı, verelim mi, mozaikler başımıza bir dert getirir mi vesaire gibi e, sorularla karşılaşıyoruz. Özellikle bu konuyu seçtik. Bu konuda iki tane birbirinden değerli konuşmacımız var. Bir tanesi Slovenya'dan Sayın Profesör Barit Kovacic bizlere mekanizmalarını anlatacak. E, mozaisizmin mekanizmalarını ve daha sonra da e, biyolojik mekanizmaları da anlatacak. Bu biyolojik mekanizmalardan sonra da time lapse ile ilgili e, klinik ve mozaik embriyolar arasındaki sanıyorum kendi eksperyanslarını, deneyimlerini paylaşacaklar. İkinci konuşmacı da sevgili arkadaşımız, yönetim kurulu üyemiz Cem Demirel klinik olarak nasıl yaklaşım onu anlatacak. E, ben e, Kovacic'e davet edeceğim. E, First of all, I would like to invite Professor Barut Kovacic. Uh, he is uh, one of the successful embryologists in the world, and at the same time, he is very good friend of us. He is working uh, as a head of the IVF laboratory in University Medical Center, Maribor, Slovenia. He is professor of cell biology at the University of Ljubljana, Slovenia also. And then uh, he published more than 60 scientific papers and 20 book chapters. And he's also active member of ESHRE. Uh, and he worked in, uh, in the executive committee, post coordinator of embryology certification committee, post coordinator of ESHRE certification programs. Also, member of ART Center Certification Committee. So his topic is the mechanism of the mosaicism. And uh, if he has enough time, he will talk about the uh, time-lapse uh, incubation or incubator and then uh, relation between this mosaic embryo and then time-lapse incubation. Okay, Professor Kovacic. So, <clears throat> thank you, uh, uh, dear organizers, for uh, first for this kind of invitation. Uh, I'm glad uh, to be with you on this webinar. Uh, <clears throat> so I will present you an overview about uh, known mechanisms for mosaicism in uh, pre-implantation human embryos. And uh, I have to declare that uh, I have no conflict of interest. But uh, at the same time, I would like to say that uh, in my IVF laboratory, we don't uh, do PGTA. So um, I think this is uh, quite important to, to mention uh, uh, at the beginning. So the following uh, objectives will be discussed. First, uh, I will make a short introduction in embryo mosaicisms and their uh, impacts on uh, embryo development. Uh, then we will try to see an overview on diverse events that uh, lead to mosaic embryos. Uh, <clears throat> I will try to do a deeper insights in uh, cellular and molecular factors uh, that are responsible for all these errors. 
And uh, at the end, uh, we will have a review on self-correction mechanisms for rescuing embryos from uh, numeric uh, chromosomal uh, abnormalities. So <clears throat> let's go to the introduction. We know that uh, today that uh, aneuploidies may occur at the higher uh, frequency in human embryos. So the estimation is that the prevalence is about 30% uh, in uh, women at 30s and uh, about 90% uh, uh, at uh, older uh, women at 44. And uh, many of them derive from all sides, uh, from mal segregation of uh, chromosomes uh, during meiosis, causing, uh, causing uh, uniform aneuploidies. And this phenomenon uh, is critically dependent of maternal age. Uh, about 20 to 25 percent of human oocytes were identified as aneuploid in younger women, while at uh, older, as many as 50 percent of oocytes were affected. So besides uniform aneuploidies, cleavage uh, stage human embryos exhibit high rates of mosaicism between blastomers. Uh, by the estimation, 70% mosaics were detected at the cleavage stage and 40% mosaics at the blastocyst uh, stage embryos, also in women at 30s. But uh, we know that not all mosaicisms are uh, lethal. So <clears throat> although the vast majority of chromosomal imbalances in the pre-implantation embryo are mostly due to meiotic errors uh, presented on the left side of this slide, uh, several phenomena may occur at all stages of early embryo development that result in uh, defective mitosis consequently producing cell lines with distinct uh, genetic constitution. And uh, most uh, aneuploidies from meiosis are of maternal origin and are strongly age-related. Paternal origin is just neglig negligible. Uh, but mitotically derived aneuploidies are not dependent on maternal age. How we classify uh, the different type of mosaicisms. So by definition, embryo mosaicism originates from mitotic segregation errors in postzygotic development stages of an euploid or aneuploid conceptus. And embryonic mosaicism can be widely classified in following categories. Uh, aneuploidy, aneuploidy, where all cell lines carry chromosomal uh, defects. This type derives from an aneuploid zygote with an error that occurs in one of the following mitotic cycles. Then euploid, aneuploid, this type uh, derives from euploid zygote undergoing an aberrant uh, mitotic division or aneuploid zygote uh, or from aneuploid zygote uh, undergoing self-repairing mechanisms by rebalancing uh, chromosomal copies. And then we also have a ploidy mosaics with uh, the presence of uh, cell lines with different ploidy levels. For example, uh, very often we can see diploid tetraploid uh, mosaics uh, in an embryo. And this type derives from uh, a cell failing to, to divide uh, through cytokinesis, thus retaining double the number of chromosomes. Um, we also have a chaotic mosaicism where multiple mitotic errors are sequentially uh, occurred, generating several cell lines and usually these embryos uh, are fragmented uh, and uh, very quickly arrest in their development. So what is the impact of mosaicism on the embryo? First, we know that mitotic error can happen in any of embryonic developmental stages. Uh, the proportion of this secondary new and pathologic karyotype uh, depends on embryonic stage by the hypothetical principle. The earlier the error occurs, the higher the proportion of the embryo is affected. 
However, several uh, certain chromosomal defects, um, especially if they are very complex, may cause the arrest of the cell cycle in the affected cell, thus avoiding its proportional contribution to the embryo. And depending on the affected cell lineage commitment, uh, mosaicism can be distributed uh, throughout the embryo or confined to a certain tissue, for example, to only to, to trophectoderm or only to uh, inner cell mass. And later than methodic error occurs, higher is a chance that mosaicism will involve both embryonic and extraembryonic tissue. So <clears throat> lineage commitment of cells carrying secondary cardiotypes has significant impact on the type of mosaicism affecting the embryo. Uh, for instance, uh, when both main uh, embryo cell lineage, ICA and trophectoderm, are composed of mosaic cardiotypes, mitotic error most probably occurred at a very early stage. This embryo will show uh, total mosaicism. If a defective mitotic event occurs at the earlier stages, when blastomers are already determined to become trophic derm or ICM, then the secondary pathologic cardiotype will be equally represented in all cells of trophectoderm and ICM. And this type is called confined, complete trophectoderm or ICM mosaicism. Uh, but if the error occurs in a differentiated cells, then the pathologic cardiotype will be presented only in, uh, in a part of trophectoderm or in a part of ICM, and is then confined partially ICM or trophectoderm mosaicism and can develop into the organ-specific mosaicism like confined placental mosaicism or confined germline mosaicisms. And now <clears throat> we can see what the distribution of mosaicism in the blastocyst may be. And also we can see uh, the relativity of sampling uh, when we do the biopsy of trophectoderm, and also the relativity of validity of diagnostic results. So the fate of the embryo examined ultimately depends uh, primarily uh, on the sampling side uh, of the trophectoderm cells. So <clears throat> let's look now uh, the causes of mosaicism in an embryo. And uh, as we know, based on the literature, it can be said that uh, mechanisms for embryo mosaicisms have not yet been uh, uh, completely clarified. And uh, there are just hypotheses, and uh, most of these hypotheses are based on theoretical mechanistic models for post-zygotic chromosomal uh, errors in uh, uh, pre-implantation embryos, and they have to be proved by uh, new experiments. And uh, to now, we know that chromosome non-disjunction and anaphase legs seem to be the two most plausible causes of uh, imperfect cell division. Uh, leading to a mosaic embryo. Another mechanism known to also to participate the mosaicism are uh, endoreplication and also random segregation after different replication failures. Uh, but let's see now um, one by one uh, the principles of each of the mentioned uh, mechanisms. So non-disjunction uh, occurs uh, when one set of replicated chromatids paired on metaphase plate fails to migrate to opposite mitotic poles, uh, segregating later in, in the daughter uh, cells, uh, daughter cell instead. And uh, this mitotic non-disjunction results the presence of blastomers with the trisomy uh, which is compensated uh, by a monosomy in uh, another uh, uh, daughter blastomer. And uh, this was thought to be the most common mechanism of mosaicism in pre-implantation development, but current views suggested that it is a rare event during mitosis. Uh, it is mechanism leading to aneuploidy in meiosis amongst the autosomes, 
and mechanisms for sex chromosome malsegregation during the first cleavage stage divisions uh, dismissed during mitosis. Let's see now the anaphys leg. Uh, it refers to situation when uh, one chromatid is dissociated from the spindle and is not incorporated into the nucleus of one of two daughter cells. And the result is uh, monosomy and disomy mosaic. And some studies indicated that more than 50% of all mosaic embryos are caused by anaphase lagging. And this chromatid can be or surrounded by nuclear envelope forming a micronucleus within one daughter blastomer or excluded from the blastomer is a cytoplasmic fragment containing micronucleus or containing just uh, scattered chromosomes. And the main cause of anaphase lagging is supposed to be a dysfunction of kinetohor to attach to the spindle uh, adequately. Then it is known uh, this specific case of trisomy uh, rescue, which is a kind of anaphase lag. Uh, it is involved in, uh, in this process where one gain chromatid uh, from trisomic blastomer is replicated and paired, but then lagged. And it is not incorporated into the nucleus of one of two daughter cells, uh, <clears throat> so that the result is a two daughter disomic blastomers and one fragment with excluded uh, chromosome. <clears throat> We know that uh, trisomy rescue is uh, also connected with uniparental disomy. Uh, this can occur when uh, during mitosis, both chromosome copies from one parent don't segregate, but their pairs migrate to opposite poles, while uh, one chromatid of the same chromosome from another parent is lagged during segregation. And the result are two daughter blastomers, one with trisomy, and one disomic and excluded chromosomes in the fragment. What about uh, endoreplication? Uh, this is a replication of the chromosome without the division. Uh, this results in a trisomic chromosome in one cell and a disomic chromosome in the other. And there are two mechanisms leading to this uh, phenomenon. First, a cell cycle malfunction in which a chromosome is replicated without subsequent cytokinesis, or when mitosis is initiated and shortly thereafter shut down. But in pre-implantation embryos, <clears throat> at least we embryologists, uh, very often see blastomers with two nuclei. Uh, in this case, there is a replication of, most probably the replication of all chromosomes followed by karyokinesis, but cytokinesis uh, did not occur, leading to polyploidy. If this happens in one blastomeres and not in others, we get a diploid tetraploid mosaic. And two blastomer fusion also leads to the, to the same situation as we can see here. We had two blastomers that fused, uh, that divided in, uh, in uh, two daughter cells, uh, uh, resulting four cell embryos, but uh, then uh, reverse cleavage uh, uh, occurs. And uh, now we have again uh, two cell embryos, uh, probably with duplicated number of chromosomes in each blastomers. So <clears throat> random segregation after uh, different replication failures uh, can result in uh, blastomers with the split chromosome complement or major fragmentation of the nucleus within a blastomer or uh, can result uh, in uh, uh, major uh, fragments uh, within an embryo. And now let's see uh, the different factors contributing uh, to mitotic errors. First, paternal, uh, uh, the factors of uh, paternal origin. As we know, <clears throat> the most responsible organelle participating in mitotic errors is inherited paternally. This is sperm centrosome, and it represents first a microtubule organizing center and consists of a centriole, which should divide and uh, form first mitotic spindle, 
And once uh, the centrosome appears in the ovoplasm, it start, uh, uh, It usually starts to uh, polymerize microtubules in uh, forming uh, sperm aster. So a delay in sperm aster formation could induce aneuploidy. And such aneuploidies are more, more prevalent in patients uh, with severe male factor infertility, especially in, in those where we use testicular sperm, immature sperm, probably with immature centrosomes. Another, another problem uh, occurs when more sperm centrosomes appear in the oocytes, and the zygote uh, have some kind of abilities to reduce or not to, to use uh, this uh, sufficient uh, additional centrosome. Uh, but this can happen when centrioles split to three instead of two centrioles, or when two sperm cells enter the egg. And spindle assembly is usually well controlled, but uh, during early cleavage stages, this control is much uh, weakened. <clears throat> Three centrosomes in one oocyte usually result in tripolar mitosis and consequently a chromosomal chaos in, in daughter cells. Uh, so uh, we can talk about chaotic uh, mosaicisms. Uh, but one additional centros centrosome can disturb canetohor kind of microtubule attachment, which can then result in an anaphase lake and loss of chromosomes or uh, formation of micro micronuclei. Uh, such tripolar division is uh, known among embryologists uh, that use time-lapse technology. Uh, and this phenomenon is uh, named as direct cleavage from one to three blastomers. <clears throat> so analyzing this, uh, the, the cells, the chromosomal uh, status of each of uh, such blastomers, uh, showed that chromosomal segregation depends on chromosome position within such tripolar spindle. Uh, from McCoy paper, it is evident that around 50% of uh, blastomers from such tripolar uh, divisions uh, were aneuploid. What about maternal factors? Uh, there are the mechanisms that lead to an increase in aneuploidy with advanced maternal age are uh, largely are unclear, but it is very interesting study from uh, Holubkova and from Zielinska uh, uh, group. Uh, they presented in their paper that the majority of sister kinetohors are split during meiosis one in human oocytes and they don't behave as a single functional unit during the first meiotic division. So by using time-lapse immunofluorescent confocal microscopy, they showed that the, the, the distance between kinetohors is age-related. So uh, the, the older is a woman, uh, the, the longest is a distance between uh, two kinetohors. And they also found that the sister kinetohors allowed bivalence to rotate by 90 degrees on the spindle. Uh, <clears throat> so this is a nice uh, opportunity which allows uh, merotelic kinetohor microtubule attachment, which correlates with malsegregation of chromosomes. What does it mean, merotelic uh, uh, kinetohor microtubule attachment? This means that one kinetohor uh, is connected uh, with microtubules of uh, two different poles. And premature separation, this is presented here. And uh, premature uh, separation of uh, sister chromatids and reverse segregation are more common error mechanisms, both of which involve the loss of cohesion between uh, both chromatids, potentially due to deterioration of cohesin proteins. Uh, so Cliff and Schuch uh, presented that there are different mechanisms and proteins involved in uh, meiotic and mitotic chromosome segregations, where uh, meiotic uh, proteins and cohesins are much more uh, sensi sensitive on, on uh, different factors. 
So <clears throat> many studies recognize maternal RNA as one of the most influencing maternal factors responsible for this aberrant segregation of chromosomes. Uh, and uh, uh, initial cleavage divisions uh, proceed under control of maternal RNAs and proteins provided in the, uh, in the uh, oplasm. And they're essential regulators of different cell cycle uh, progression. So the shift from meiotic to a mitotic mode of spindle might disturb the stability of genome. Furthermore, diminished maternal transcripts before genome activation could lead to the weaknesses of mitotic checkpoints. Uh, for example, spindle assembly checkpoint is one of such important checkpoints. Uh, but at the same time, the cell cycle drivers are overexpressed in early embryos, uh, which means that they drive zygote over fast cleavages. And Vera Rodriguez and the colleagues demonstrated that each zygote inherit, inherits a transcriptome of specific genes involved in a cell cycle control. So the chromosomal fate of an embryo is determined at the pronuclear stage by a 12 gene transcriptomic signature. The zygotes with, with altered uh, transcriptome of these 12 genes uh, they showed that they were more prone to develop mosaicisms. And <clears throat> what about external influences? Because we know that the literature is full of papers about possible impact of ovarian stimulation protocols and all set quality, uh, on all set quality and uh, negative effect uh, of unstable culture conditions or uh, cooling and so on. So <clears throat> regarding stimulation, um, there is a paper from uh, Mune. Uh, this is an old uh, report from 1997 about significant variation in the rates of monocytosisms across uh, four different IVF centers and also differences within an IVF center when uh, they decided to change the hormonal stimulation protocol. Uh, it's interesting, but uh, later it was shown that, uh, uh, that stimulation protocols have a minor effect on uh, mosaicisms. This was proved by a much larger number of patients involved and also by uh, recent uh, uh, cytogenetics uh, methodologies. Then other authors revealed that uh, <clears throat> there is an impact of different oxygen concentrations on uh, the, the embryo quality. Uh, and they showed that uh, reduced oxygen decreased the sex chromosome mosaicism when compared with culture in atmospheric oxygen levels. Also, <clears throat> the analysis, uh, comparing analysis of uh, the effect of different cultural media showed that a single step medium uh, <clears throat> practically yield, yielded higher blastocyst formation rate, but uh, also a higher aneuploidy rate compared with sequential medium. And uh, we all know uh, in the lab that there is a significant effect of uh, cooling, uh, drop of temperature during uh, on-site culture or during on-site or embryo manipulation. Uh, uh, this, all these uh, uh, effects are irreversible and causes uh, disruption of spindles and cytoskelet, uh, causing uh, aneuploidies uh, in developing embryo. So there are external factors that can influence uh, the, the rate of mosaic seasons. Uh, and we can ask ourselves if there are any embryonic factors involved in mosaic seasons. Uh, cleavage stage embryos exhibit weakened mitotic checkpoints, as it was mentioned before. Uh, this potentially facilitates rapid cleavage divisions. However, Embryos that diverge in the precise timing of specific parameters, what we can now follow by time lapse, for example, if they uh, uh, they don't fit uh, in, in time of uh, 
in uh, optimal time of duration of first cytokinesis or, or optimal time between first, second, or third mitosis, they usually exhibit frequent anaphase lag or uh, micronuclei formation. And uh, we also know that uh, embryo uh, can exclude some, some blastomers from the formation of, uh, of blastocysts. Uh, this can be visible at the morula stage. Uh, so it was revealed that the majority of uh, these excluded blastomers were anoploid. But interesting, the trophectoderm cells from biopsied blastocysts developed from such morulas were normal. So this opened the question about possible self-corrections of aneuploid mosaic human embryos. And based on, on studies by using time-lapse technology and also uh, numerous studies uh, on PGTA in last couple of years, many atypical embryo cleavage phenomena might be today interpreted as a self-correction mechanism uh, by which the embryo recognizes uh, and excludes uh, abnormal cells or gain chromosomes from subsequent development. Um, as we can see here, there is a zygote uh, with ruffling cytoplasm. We can see that there are some, uh, before for cytokinesis, some uh, fragments appeared. Uh, the zygote cleaved uh, directly to four uh, blastomers and then most of these blastomers merge. Uh, now we have uh, two differently sized blastomers and many fragments. So uh, <clears throat> what, is this something that went wrong or is this something uh, where embryo wanted to repair uh, some abnormalities uh, in, the chromosomal, in the chromosomal status? So there are different uh, self-correction theories. Uh, <clears throat> We know that uh, human embryos with meiotic errors, monosomies or trisomies, and those that appear to be triploid or tetraploid typically exhibit fragmentation at the one cell stage. Uh, this suggests that embryos respond to aneuploidy but uh, by fragmenting. Uh, perhaps uh, is this one of the survival uh, mechanisms. Uh, and then fragmentation is most often detected at the two cell stage in embryos with mitotic errors. And the embryo probably divided before the lagging chromosomes were properly aligned on the mitotic spindle, uh, resulting in the formation of micronuclei and its isolation into cellular fragment. And these fragments can either remain or be reabsorbed by the blastomer from which they originated to restore the ploidy status or, or they can fuse with neighboring blastomer to generate the complex embryonic aneuploidies. And then we have morulas that are uh, undergoing cavitation to form a blastocyst, which often reveal the presence of a large and likely aneuploid blastomer excluded from, from the embryo. Uh, these are four, uh, four theories uh, that still need to be proved by, by new experiments. And uh, there are many discussions now about these theories. I would recommend you to, to read uh, this paper that has just been published in the Human Reproduction Update, uh, uh, prepared by Koticho and uh, colleagues. Uh, where all these mechanisms are uh, uh, described in more details. And this is the end of my presentation. I can conclude uh, what we know that mosaicism means the presence of two or more genotypically different uh, cells in an embryo. It is uh, present in 2% uh, prenatal uh, specimens and in as many as 70% of cleavage embryos. So the mechanisms for mosaicism have not been fully clarified. There are still theoretical uh, models uh, and need uh, to be confirmed. Uh, the primary causes are chromatid non-disjunction, anaphase lag, and the replication, uh, replication failures and random segregation. We also know trisomy rescue. 
and embryos show great plasticity in developmental patterns and use different self-correction mechanisms for repairing chromosomal status. However, all these theories still have to be proved by additional experiments. So that's all, thank you. Okay, thank you, Professor Borut Kovacic. It was very, very nice and then very educative uh, presentation. Uh, Jem, if you wish, you can speak English. Well, I can speak. I mean, uh, you are the boss. No, no. Uh, maybe at the end of the session, uh, Professor Kovacic also can participate to all questions and, and discussion, everything. If you wish, okay. you can start. Okay. Okay, uh, Professor Kovacic, we will get the uh, question at the end of this webinar, okay? okay. So, uh, Dr. Demiral will talk English. Okay, okay. For you, okay. So, uh, let me start sharing my screen. Okay, so uh, uh, after the wonderful lecture of uh, Dr. Kovacic, I will, uh, as a clinician, try to explain uh, how, how we manage uh, when we get the report of a mosaic embryo by PGTA uh, as a clinician. So how would be our management in such a case? Uh, I would like to go over what an embryo, embryonic mosaicism is uh, once again. Uh, as uh, Dr. Kovacic already uh, very clearly defined, the mosaicism in an embryo means the presence of more than two distinct chromosomal constitution cell lines in an embryo at the same time. So as you can see in an embryo, you will have both some euploid cells and aneuploid cells. And it's a very common phenomenon in pre-implantation embryos. In every stage of the pre-implantation development, we come across embryonic mosaicism. It's a very frequent finding, but actually we see it in the minority of the embryos uh, as, as a total. Uh, what we mean about embryonic mosaicism, first of all, when uh, there is an error in meiosis, we end up with aneuploidy of the embryo with the meiotic error. But afterwards, uh, in the post-zygotic uh, post stage, when we have additionally some errors in the mitosis, then we will also have mosaicism, different kind of cell lines. So this embryo has a mitotic error that makes it an aneuploid embryo plus mitotic errors after the uh, post-psychotic development. This will make it a, a mosaic embryo with different cell lines. Actually, this is not our target for the clinical management because this embryo, uh, since it has a mitotic, uh, meiotic error, we have to discard it. What we should be dealing with and what, uh, what as a clinician, what should be uh, we should decide to do is this type of embryos. There is no uh, error in my, uh, meiotic error. So we have uh, euploid cell lines, but afterwards in post-mitotic, uh, po in uh, post-zygotic development, we have some mitotic errors, which makes the embryo to have some uh, aneuploid cells as well. So. Uh, we are, uh, as a clinician, we have to decide what to do when we get the report of a diploid, aneuploid embryo. So uh, these are very uh, crucial uh, definitions uh, to clarify uh, before starting the lecture. And uh, the other thing as clinicians, uh, we have to know a little bit uh, about the biology, biology of the embryonic development. 
as we all know, we take trophectoderm biopsies. But look at the different kind of scenarios in a trophectoderm biopsy. For instance, look at this embryo. We have haploid and unaploid cell lines in the trophectoderm. When we take biopsy from this embryo from the trophectoderm, it may give us the impression that this embryo has mosaicism. But actually, the inner cell mass is completely euploid. So it means the trophectoderm biopsy is not all of the time representative of the embryonic uh, chromosomal status, which is uh, very critical for decision making. And also, uh, look at this embryo. Again, uh, we have some uh, uh, unaploid cells, we have some haploid cells. When we take the biopsy, on this side, let's say we take one, two, three, four, five cells, we will, say, we will see that one out of these five cells has unaploidy. But when we take the biopsy from somewhere else where the unaploid cells are more frequent, then this biopsy will show that this embryo has a high level of mosaicism, unaploidy. This will also make, give us some conf uh, confusion. So uh, in conclusion, the trophectoderm biopsy we have to know that is not very representative of the whole embryonic chromosomal constitution. Uh, let's have a look at the uh, uh, platforms as a clinician when we have a, a report of an embryo in our hand. This is a NGS uh, platform, uh, uh, NGS uh, platform of an uh, embryo after PGTA cycle. So let's start uh, looking at the upper panel of, of, of an embryo. As you can see, the two uh, line represents the diazomy state, diploid line. Three line represents the triploid, trisomy, and one represents the monosomy. So as you can clearly see here, chromosome number two, chromosome number five, chromosome, oh, sorry. Chromosome number uh, seven, eight, nine, they are all trisomic uh, uh, chromosomes. So uh, one additional chromosome. But let's have a look at the chromosome number se uh, 17. As you can see, it lies in between the trisomic and disomic line. So it lies in between. What does it mean? It means that out of the trophectoderm cells that we got, that we have obtained, some cells are uh, having more than one, uh, uh, two chromosome 17, and some have uh, a double uh, chromosome 17. So uh, this shows us a mon monosomy. This, uh, and please look at the other uh, example, chromosome number 21. It's again, it lies between a monosomy one and disomy two. So it lies in between. So this shows that there's a mixture of cells. So it shows that this embryo may have mosaicism, but actually this is a, a chaotic unaploid embryo. So it has a major meiotic error plus some post-zygotic mitotic errors. So we have to discard this embryo for sure. But let's have a look at this embryo the, the, in the lower panel we can see that all the chromosomes are disomic, haploid, but the chromosome number 14 is not trisomic, it's about the line, is not monosomic, but it is not trisomic, it doesn't reach the three, line, uh, three uh, point line, it lies in between. So it's, it's, it shows us that there's a mixture of cells. So it has, uh, it's, uh, by this way, we can make a diagnosis of the mosaicism. Let's uh, have uh, some more examples. In this uh, upper panel, uh, chromosome number 20 also uh, have a uh, mosaicism above the uh, disomy line. Chromosome number 22 here has a uh, intermediate uh, chromosome copy number. It doesn't reach the trisomy uh, level. So it is not a trisomic embryo. It lies in between chromosome 
intermediate chromosome copy number lies in between. So it's, it shows us, us that this is a mosaic embryo. This is an euploid embryo, as you can see in this panel. So these are the examples uh, of uh, the uh, reports that we receive in daily life. Uh, so actually, uh, we see all in those reports an intermediate chromosome copy number variation. I, I'm not telling mosaicism because I will explain why. So actually we have to change the topic of the lecture to what as clinicians should do when we come across an intermediate chromosome copy number in an NGS report. Because this is not a direct measurement of the cell number, direct measurement of the euploid and unaploid cells in a sample. With the NGS, we are not making a direct measurement. We are just uh, seeing some uh, uh, chromosomes having an intermediate chromosome copy number. Mosaicism may be a reason for this intermediate chromosome copy number variation, but it's not the only and sole reason for this phenomenon. So actually, we are uh, talking about a phenomenon. Uh, we are not really measuring mosaicism directly with these uh, methods. This is very important. So uh, when we have a mosaicism report uh, in a sample, we can have some uh, false, uh, how to say, conclusions. First of all, uh, there is a biological basis for this. Trophectoderm biopsy may not be representative of the inner cell mass, the, uh, the uh, embryo itself. So because of this biological reality, uh, we may come across, we may end up with a, a wrong conclusion. There are also some technical, uh, uh, technical defects. What do I mean by technical defects? First of all, we take, we are ideally, we have to take at least five cells in a, a trophectoderm biopsy. And we have, when we are take, taking the biopsy, we have to use a good technique. How, uh, for instance, if we are using a laser, we have to shut the contact, uh, the ga uh, gap junctions between the cells. Uh, we have to take at least five cells, but not more than 10 cells. If you, if you take less than five cells, then uh, we may end up with a higher incidence of most, uh, intermediate chromosome copy number reporting. So the poor biopsy technique, uh, the cellular damage during the biopsy, uh, et cetera, may give us uh, the report uh, falsely that this embryo has a mosaicism. Actually, this is very critical. So technical problems, are a cause of the uh, mosaicism, uh, mosaicism reported, uh, reporting in uh, PGTA cycles. Also, the, uh, the uh, laboratories, genetic laboratories uses algorithms. So they obtain uh, hundreds of uh, data from the DNA libraries. They set up a, a DNA library and they uh, give their results uh, according to the uh, software. So it's uh, actually uh, biomedical so uh, uh, software. So if they do not make the setup very good, there will be background noises. So uh, you can think that this embryo has an intermediate chromosome copy number variation, but actually it, has, it doesn't, it's just a background noise. So at, other than the biological factors, the technical factors also result in a wrong uh, diagnosis of the embryonic mosaicism. And uh, uh, in general, uh, the reporting mosaicism in incidents, reported mosaicism, uh, mosaicism incidents by using NGS platforms in the blastocyst stage differs widely from centers to center. So in literature, it, is, it, it has been shown to range from two to 40%, uh, but actually, most of the time, we can we can uh, uh, tell that the usual expected frequency should be around five to ten percent. The incidence of the intermediate copy number variation using NGS. So, uh, 
let's go back to this uh, slide again. Yeah, I want to go back to this slide again because I will show you uh, something else. Uh, let us take this embryo, okay? So uh, this is the disomy line. This is the, the blue line is the trisomy line. And we have an intermediate copy number variation. So chromosome number 22 is an intermediate copy number. So it means from the biopsy that we have taken, there are some normal cells and uh, also some cells with trisomy, okay? If this, uh, if this uh, report, if this line uh, is close to the uh, disomy line, then it, it, is, uh, it, it is regarded as a low mosaicism, low level of mosaicism. But if it is close to the trisomic line, it has a high level of mosaicism, which is very logical because uh, we have taken five cells. If we have one cell on uh, only uh, trisomic, then this will be close to the uh, disomic line. If let's say two or three, four cells are trisomic, it will be close to the uh, trisomic line. So uh, high mosaicism, low mosaicism is uh, defined in such a, a logic. So um, in all the laboratories, uh, we, when we are talking about the intermediate copy number variation, we talk about uh, if it has a high mosaic rate, low mosaic rate. So uh, when the embryos fall into the category of between 20 to 80%, as I showed in this previous, uh, previous graph, uh, this uh, line, the, uh, uh, <laughs> within this line, when we grade it within this line, if it show, uh, falls in between 20 to 80 percent, then this uh, it means that this embryo may have mosaicism. Okay, if the level of uh, uh, if the level is less than 20 percent, then most of the time it is regarded as euploid. If it is more than 80 percent, it is regarded as aneuploid. When it falls in between. It it is it, it is it it means it is a it, it may have a mosaic uh, constitution, and when it is between twenty to forty percent, it is regarded as low mosaic constitution. When it is uh, more than forty percent and between forty and eighty percent, it is regarded as high level mosaic mosaicism. It is very simple because why we call uh, 20, 40, 60, 80 percent gradients because basically in a trophectoderm biopsy, we are supposed to retrieve five cells. So we divide uh, 100 to five. So by this way, we uh, put 20% uh, gradients. If one cell is uh, unemployed, then it is 20%. If cell, two cell unemployed, 40%. So this is the main logic. Uh, we, uh, uh, of course, uh, for the last uh, recent years, we uh, received the uh, uh, we received the reports uh, of uh, unemployed, uh, sorry, mosaicism reports, and we have to decide what we should do with these embryos because sometimes in PGTA cycles we don't have any euploid embryos in our hand. We just have uh, only uh, mosaic embryos in our hand, or we may have used, we may have transferred the euploid embryos, but we didn't get a pregnancy. Then we are left only with the mosaics in our hands. So what uh, can we do with the mosaic embryos? What are the outcome of these mosaic embryos? The first report that showed us that with the transfer of mosaic embryos, healthy pregnancies can be obtained came in 2015. In this report, by using array CGH, the authors have detected 4% of the embryos as having mosaicism. And since they have no other available euploid embryos in their hands, they transferred these mosaic embryos. And out of the 18 embryos that they transferred, they ended up with six pregnancies, 33% ongoing pregnancies. So this was the first report that shows us that with the transfer of the mosaic embryos, we can have a healthy newborns with no chromosomal abnormality. This is a very, this is the first report showing the feasibility of the mosaic embryo transfer. Uh, 
But there is one, one thing, which is the ongoing implantation rate is less with mosaic embryos as compared to euploid embryos. And also the miscarriage rate is more with mosaic embryos compared to euploid embryos. Therefore, mosaic embryos can implant, can progress to ter term, but significantly less compared to the euploid embryos. So it has a less uh, overall performance. Uh, in uh, 2019, the Society of Pre-Implantation Genetic Diagnosis made a statement about the use of the uh, mosaic embryos. Uh, made, made an overall statement. Actually, at that time, we did not have too much experience with the outcome of the uh, transfer of mosaic embryos. In this report, uh, they claim that when the mosaicism level is less than 40%, the chance of a successful uh, and healthy delivery is good. But when the level of mosaicism increases, here in this case between 40 to 80%, the chance for a successful pregnancy outcome is worse. And when we have more than one chromosomes involved, which we call it mosaic, uh, complex uh, mosaic embryos, the chance to have a delivery is really, really low, but still there is the chance. And one other thing that I have to mention is that when the level of mosaicism is low, then uh, the trophectoderm biopsy result shows good correlation with the inner cell mass chromosomal constitution, which is uh, logical. Uh, but when the mosaicism, le mosaicism level is high, then uh, the, uh, uh, I'm sorry, I, <laughs> because of uh, English, I, uh, I just talk, uh, told the opposite. When we have a low level of mosaicism, the uh, concordance between the trophectoderm biopsy result and inner cell mass result is low, which means when we uh, find low mosaicism in trophectoderm biopsy, then it means that most probably this embryo has a normal chromosomal constitution in the inner cell mass. But when it has a trophectoderm biopsy shows a high level of mosaicism, then it means that most probably the inner cell mass also has a high incidence of chromosomal mosaicism. So there's a high correlation, which is also logical. So uh, what are the uh, factors uh, uh, for the embryos with mosaic resu results that may uh, favor us uh, to make the transfer or not? First of all, I mentioned the percentage of, and the level of mosaicism, which is very critical high mosaicism, low mosaicism. So transferring low mosaic embryos, low level mosaic embryos gives us a better chance. What about the specific chromosomes involved? Actually in the PGDS, uh, PGDS uh, um, statements or guidelines, previous guidelines uh, put some emphasis on the specific chromosomes. But later on, we understood that the type of the chromosome involved is not so important. The level of mosaicism is important. What about the monosomy versus trisomy mosaicism? Some people used to claim that when we have a, a monosomic, tris, trisomic, a monosomic mosaicism, uh, the uh, transfer may be preferred as compared to a trisomic mosaicism. But it is not re really the truth. The, uh, monosomy and trisomy mosaic, mosaic embryos uh, behave the same way. So again, this uh, definition, this uh, distinction is not uh, valid anymore. Full chromosome versus partial chromosome. What I mean by partial chromosome is that with the current NGS techniques, we can detect uh, chromosomal deletions and duplications that are more than 10 megabyte uh, in more than 10 megabyte uh, big big so we can uh, detect small chromosomal deletion and duplications as well so compared and we call them segmental uh, segmental uh, mosaics full chromosome mosaics 
perform worse than segmented mosaics. I will come to this po point later on. And the number of chromosomes involved are also important. If we have more than one, two, three mosaic uh, uh, chromosomes involved in mosaicism, the outcome is worse. Uh, so uh, actually we didn't have too much experience, too much data about the outcome of the mosaic embryos transferred so far. But very recently, a very recent paper that came out in fertility and sterility uh, in 2021, a very recent, a very new one uh, from, the, uh, uh, from the group uh, of Manuele Biotti, a very nice paper because they give us the data of 1000 mosaic embryo transfers. So uh, when the investigators looked at the quality of the Euploid embryos and compared them with the mosaic embryos, they, they saw that the inner cell mass grade and trophectoderm grade are worse in mosaic embryos compared to the euploid embryos. So they thought that maybe the uh, mosaic embryos have a worse blastocyst morphology and that's the reason of their low performance. So they tried to match the same blastocyst embryo quality between euploid and mosaic embryos and they still found out that when we match the embryos with the same embryo morphology, the mosaic embryos still perform worse. So it's not a matter of the embryo quality, morphology quality, but the mosaic mosaicism itself uh, results in a worse perf performance. But still, we can have uh, pregnancies. We can have ongoing pregnancies and deliveries, even with the uh, high level mosaic, complex mosaic embryo transfers. So uh, when, uh, in this paper, when we look at the implantation ongoing pregnancy rates, we see that mosaic embryos uh, perform worse than euploid embryos in terms of implantation, in terms of ongoing pregnancy rates. And in terms of abortion rates, all again, mosaic embryos have more abortion compared to the euploid embryos. When we uh, take into consideration the level of mosaicism, it also has a very important effect on the outcome. So when the level of mosaicism is less than 50%, the implantation and ongoing pregnancies are much better in uh, mosaic embryos with a mosaicism level less than uh, 50%. So it means that the level of mosaicism plays a very important role. When we have a low level of mosaicism, the embryos perform better. But, uh, I told before that uh, monosomy and trisomy uh, embryos perform, mosaic embryos perform similar. Years ago, we thought that uh, we should we can uh, transfer monosomic uh, mosaics because uh, we thought that they would uh, uh, they would perform better uh, because uh, um, uh, compared to the monosomic trisomies. But this paper clearly showed that there is no difference in the outcome of the mosaic monosomies and mosaic trisomies. So uh, well, we have to make a, a selection between the uh, monosomy and trisomy, we can select either of, either of it. Uh, and when uh, in this paper, they also uh, uh, analyzed the embryos, both in terms of uh, chromosome numbers involved and both in terms of uh, low or high level of mosaicism. So, and they had this uh, graph in, implantation and ongoing pregnancy rates uh, as compared to the euploid uh, embryos. So the segmental uh, mosaics, which means, uh, I told before that segmental mosaics means little deletion of, or duplication in uh, some of the chromosomes. Uh, the level of mosaicism doesn't matter for the segmental mosaics, but uh, the level of mosaicism is very critical when whole chromosomes are involved uh, so it is uh, uh, better with low uh, mosaics, mosaics compared to the high mosaics, and it becomes more, worse as the number of chromosomes involved increase. 
So in, in conclusion, we can, uh, in this graph, we can just uh, show the uh, favorable outcome uh, when uh, the uh, embryo uh, quality, uh, the, the mosaicism, mosaicism uh, comes from the uh, top of the uh, <laughs> table to the up. So the best performing ones are the segmented mosaics. Then we uh, have the low mosaics group. Uh, of course, as the number of chromosomes involved increase, the chance decrease. But the worst uh, prognosis group is the embryos with high level of mosaicism. What about the uh, outcome of the transfer of these mosaic embryos? So this group analyzed with prenatal testing of all the pregnancies achieved after uh, mosaic embryo transfers. And they, uh, they have found it with the amniocentesis they have performed. Normal, 98.6% uh, of the amniocentesis results were normal. Just 1.4% were abnormal, but this abnormality was not coming from the, uh, was not reflecting, reflecting the PGTA results. So it, it was something else. It wasn't uh, reflecting the mosaicism that the PGTA uh, was telling us. So this was very reassuring because they also analyzed the uh, uh, congenital anomalies uh, and uh, the development of the babies born so far. So this data was very assuring that with the transfer of the mosaic embryos, when the embryos uh, result in pregnancy and delivery, uh, they are genetically normal and uh, they are healthy. But what, how this happens? Uh, how this happens? Uh, I will come to this point in two minutes. Actually, there is a very recent paper coming uh, from Turkey from uh, uh, Dr. Kahraman's group. In this paper, in the literature, it is the only single case uh, with the transfer of a mosaic embryo and uh, the pregnancy is achieved and the amniocentesis uh, gives us a, a mosaic uh, a mosaic result, but the level of mosaicism was thirty five percent in the PGTA result, but in the amniocentesis the level of mosaicism dropped down to two percent. So the uh, with the uh, consultations and so forth, the uh, couple decided to continue the pregnancy and a healthy newborn was born. But this really uh, still uh, causes some concern for the health, genetic health of the babies after the mosaic embryo transfers. We have to be still very cautious. This is the only uh, report so far among maybe uh, close, uh, more than 500 uh, mosaic pregnancies uh, reported in the literature, but it still uh, makes us to be very cautious about this uh, situation. What we can do uh, when, uh, during the follow-up of the, of the pregnancies after tra transfer of a mosaic embryo, we have to do definitely amniocentesis to see the genetic of the fetus, okay? We can do uh, non-invasive prenatal testing, but if we are going to do it, we must know that it shows, it reflects the placental genetics, not the, uh, not the, fe uh, not the fetus. And just like the trophectoderm biopsy, NIPT also reflects the placental chromosomal constitution. And we have to do full chromosome, 24 chromosome and NIPT, not the uh, conventional five chromosome and NIPT. We have to do ultrasonography and we have to do uh, for the placental malfunction uh, specific evaluations. So in conclusion, um, I, these are my, my last slides. In conclusion, when we have a mosaic embryo in our hand, our first choice should be the transfer of, of course, uh, uh, if you don't have any euploid embryos, we should first try to transfer the mosaic embryos with low level mosaicism. Then our last chance uh, choice would be high level mosaic embryos. If we have an embryo with segmental mosaicism, it should be our preference compared to full chromosomal mosaicism. And uh, the type of the chromosome involved is not so important which it is very it is very critical so actually uh, we don't we do not decide on the type of the chromosome involved if we have two embryos with the same level of mosaicism then uh, we have to make selection we have to uh, 
uh, uh, we have to, we, we must not select the embryos having mosaicism of the chromosomes that may end up with uh, fetal chromosomic syndromes, like chrom uh, 13, 18, 21 or the chromosomes that may end up with uniparental disomy or in uterine growth retardation. So if we have two embryos with the same level of mosaicism in our hand, and if we're going to make a choice, then we have to uh, exclude uh, the embryos with such chromosomes, okay? Otherwise, uh, otherwise the chromosome, uh, specific chromosome type does not have an influence. What makes the influence is the level of mosaicism. And uh, let me, sorry. Uh, let me uh, tell you how this uh, happens. Uh, uh, Dr. Kovacic has clearly uh, told us that there is embryo self-correction. Uh, Eupluid cells proliferate better. And when there is a threshold of uh, euploid cells uh, uh, compared to the aneuploid cells, the embryo can accomplish, can get rid of the anaploid cells because the euploid cells uh, grow better so that uh, the embryo can, uh, can defeat the anaploid cell population. But the, when the level of the anaploid cells in an embryo exceeds a certain threshold, this is the scenario in high level mosaicism, then this self-correction mechanism cannot work. One, one important thing uh, for the clinicians is that uh, if the embryo uh, report is full uh, unemployed, there is no self-correction in this scenario. Please do not confuse self-correction for PGDA results showing full unemployed because this is a meiotic error. The embryo cannot correct itself. The self-correction is a phenomenon for the mosaic embryos. And also the studies show us that when we transfer uh, full aneuploid embryos with the non-selection studies, there are no implantation and no live birth. So this is one uh, other uh, uh, concept for self-correction. Uh, I hope uh, mm. it wasn't too long. No, no, thank you. Uh, I would like to thank to both speakers. Uh, they gave us a very, very uh, useful uh, informations. Uh, arkadaşlar herkese çok teşekkür ediyorum. Lütfen chat'a girin. O chat'ta sorularınızı sorun. Ee, oradan ancak alabiliyoruz. Sözlü olarak almamız mümkün değil biliyorsunuz. Demin de ikaz edemedim. Okay. Uh, there are some questions from audience. The first questions is from Halil Russo. Thank you for comprehensive presentation. I am curious about uh, the consequences of mesoism in the future, in future predisposition to cancer, neurodegenerative, metabolic, etc. disorder. Could both speakers share their options? Yes, Professor Borut, what is your opinion? Sorry. Uh, yeah, it, it, it's difficult to say. I, I think that uh, in the past, we didn't know anything about uh, chromosomal status of uh, in vitro developed embryos. And we performed embryo transfer of all type of embryos. Uh, I think uh, to, to answer properly this question, we should look at uh, the epidemiologic studies uh, comparing the, the, the, the incidence of cancers uh, at children conceived uh, by the natural way and, and uh, IVF. And to my knowledge, uh, there are some studies that uh, showed a slight increase, but uh, uh, another study, the studies were performed on a very uh, large number of, of uh, children. Uh, uh, I, I don't know, we, it, it is also difficult to say if the reason is the chromosomal status uh, of an embryo or any epigenetic uh, uh, uh, situation that uh, is a result of 
suboptimal culture conditions. As we know, the cultural media can influence the metabolic uh, uh, me metabolism of embryos and also the, the children, uh, the offspring from, from such embryos. Uh, I think th this is everything that I can say uh, uh, about that, so. Okay, how about uh, Jim? Uh, what, yes. you, what is your opinion? My opinion is this. Uh, first of all, uh, for every chromosome, uh, for every chromosome, uh, monosomic or trisomic mosaicisms are reported to result with uh, intellectual uh, developmental problems uh, or uh, growth retardation problems. But the problem here in, in this uh, mosaic embryo transfer is the fact that uh, when we do a mosaic embryo transfer and when we achieve a pregnancy, this mosaicism is not reflected to the uh, newborns. Because of the embryo self-correction, the uh, final outcome with the uh, chromosomal anomalies of, uh, analysis of the babies uh, all show uh, reassuring normal chromosomal constitution except the only report came for, coming from Turkey. So this is very uh, assuring, reassuring. But when we uh, talk about the chromos chromosomal mosaicism in general, for all chromosomes, uh, th there are reported cases of intellectual development problems, not particularly for cancer predisposition, but maybe it, it will also have some effects on such uh, conditions. But this is not our uh, situation here. Okay. Uh... Professor Kovacic, in your one slide, I saw that in single step uh, medium, mosaicism rate was higher than sequential step. So how can you explain this findings, this information or this result? Yeah. <laughs> yes, uh, as you probably know, uh, the appearance of single step uh, culture media uh, we were able to to listen many reports uh, about from comparative studies of different uh, culture media and uh, i remember many of them reported a higher blastocyst uh, rate in a single step uh, uh, uh, culture media but in the same time the higher rate of unemployed uh, detected in, in uh, blastocysts, so same in sequential media and the single step media. Uh, so uh, we, we don't know uh, what uh, is the mechanism, but uh, uh, our experience uh, and also some time lapse studies show that uh, the embryos uh, develop a little bit faster in single step uh, culture media. This is maybe something that uh, these checkpoints that are very weak in, uh, in uh, early cleavage uh, embryos uh, uh, are even weaker in, uh, in a single step media because the embryos are pushed to develop faster uh, due to different growth, growth factors or something that is uh, in culture media. Uh, but this is hypothesis. We cannot find the, the clear explanation uh, what is behind of this situation. Okay. Just a second. Uh, should we? Uh, should we destroy each embryo? Uh, do, no, should we trust a defected embryo uh, before transfer? So, uh, what do you say, Jem? Uh, sorry, what, what was the question? Should we? If one embryo has a defective embryo, can we, uh, should we destroy it or not? I mean, defective, uh, but I mean, uh, defective. Maybe this time, uh, some healthy uh, baby will be, 
Hadi ne diyor burada? Okay. I think yes. Uh, the question I think is this. Uh, definitely if we have a PGD result will with, with uh, uniform aneuploidy. We should discard this embryo for sure. But uh, in case of mosaic, mosaic embryos, uh, and if we don't, we don't have any uh, euploid embryos in our hands, or if we use the euploid embryos and didn't uh, end up in the pregnancy, then after a, a, cons a careful uh, genetical consultation and a discussion with the patient, we can transfer the mosaic embryo depending on the uh, level of the uh, mosaicism. We can discuss this with patient with the current data in our hands. Okay. Two both speakers again. Could they could the day six composition of embryos uh, be a marker for euploidy or mosaicism? Day six composition. Uh, day six composition may be a marker for aneuploidy because uh, the uh, progression rate, uh, uh, the blastocyst progression rate is. Uh, uh, when an embryo reaches blastocyst on day six, uh, compared to the day five uh, embryos, the uh, aneuploid rate may be increased. But for the mosaicism, there is no such a correlation. Uh, uh, so uh, what is your opinion, Dr. Kovacic? Um, I would say the same. Yeah. Okay. Um, Uh, what is the uh, uh, what what percentage is your cutoff level to transfer for mosaic embryos? There, there's a good question. Yes. Uh, by uh, Turgay Turgay Bey, what percentage is your cutoff level to transfer for mosaic embryos, Hojan? Well, uh, ask, ask to Bharat. No, <clears throat> because we don't do PGTA. I think the question is. Uh, for Professor Di uh, We prefer to transfer embryos less than 50% uh, mosaicism, level of mosaicism. But if you don't have uh, an embryo uh, with less than 50%, but let's say we have an embryo with 70% uh, of mosaicism, the only embryo in our hand is a 70% mosaicism. We have to discuss this with the patient. We have to tell the patient that this embryo has a less chance but, and high, high level of abortion. And we have to, uh, maybe the consequences uh, in the uh, uh, prenatal uh, amniocentesis, etc., may pose us bigger risks. We can transfer even this embryo because even with the high level of mosaics, we, uh, we can end with a uh, live birth. Just, it's a matter of risk stratification. But we should, absolutely perform NIPT and uh, amniocentesis during the pregnancy, right? Uh, amniocentesis is definitely, but definitely. NIPT, uh, it, it reflects, NIPT is not a method to detect mosaicism actually. It is not devised for the detection of NIPT and it shows the placental, uh, placental chromosomal constitution, not the fetal constitution. This is very important. So, so amniocentesis, right, exactly. amniocentesis is the yes. ultimate and most important method. Okay, so uh, so they are asking to Jam Demiral, in your own PGD results, what is the percentage of the mosaicism? Uh, the mosaicism, uh, just like the, uh, I mentioned in the report is serious, it is not more than 10%, like 8 to 10%. Okay. And then from Emre Pobucu, do you suggest to the patient to ask for genetical consultation or you explain the situation only? <laughs> well, uh, I uh, most of the time I explain the situation myself uh, because uh, giving the uh, risk. But uh, for some cases, for some chromosomes, I mentioned about the chromosomes involved in uniparental disomy, involved in uh, some, uh, in case of uh, complete uh, uh, aneuploidy, it, uh, resulting in live births like 13, 18, etc. I would definitely uh, suggest the involvement of a geneticist. 
Okay. Uh, and from Doğuş Demirkran, from our clinic, some articles show that the assisted hatching in day three to four enhances mosaicism. So what is your opinion? Well, <clears throat> so assisted hatching is, uh, um, um, is a method that is uh, relatively invasive. Uh, no, well, but we do assisted hatching uh, before PGTA, for example, uh, on day three and waiting till day five that the blastocysts uh, start to, uh, the trophectors start to, to go out from the hole. Uh, it, it depends a lot uh, on how it is performed. So if you are not careful enough and if you use a, a higher laser beam, then uh, you can, you can uh, really uh, make some, some harm to, to blastomers uh, that are close to the laser beam. So uh, I think this can be a reason to, uh, as one of the, the possible causes to affect the chromosomal status and causing mosaicism in such embryos. Okay, other question. Uh, when you use non-invasive non uh, PGD technology, is it possible to detect the mosaicism? Yes, go ahead. Uh, I don't have such information, so I, I don't follow this. Maybe you know, do you have any study about this? Uh, I, I didn't see. How about you, Jan? Uh, for the mosaics, uh, it, uh, it has not been validated. It's an uh, it's a area uh, for the weakness of the non-invasive uh, PGTA. It is not validated for the uh, detection of mosaicism. Mm -hmm. Okay. Zafer'den bir soru vardı. Zafer göremiyorum. Sen Can bir bakar mısın? Zafer'den bir embriyolojisten bir var. Ben bulamıyorum burada ya. Bakıyorum ben. Ee... Güzel bir soru sormuş. Zafer, do you prefer transferring embryos with full aneuploidy in bigger chromosomes in cases with no any other normal embryos? Ben soruyu okudum ben cevap vereyim mi? <gülüyor> evet. Ee, definitely we never prefer or think of transferring embryos for with full aneuploidy because when the result is full aneuploidy, it is very uh, consistent and robust that the embryo is aneuploid. There is no self-correction because it's a meiotic error. And with the tra uh, it's a non-selection studies, which means uh, without knowing the chromosomal status of the embryos, but uh, that have undergone PGTA, it has been shown that none of the embryos with aneuploidy implants or results in pregnancy. There is no way. Other question, how about the mosaicism rates among the embryos from day five to day seven? About mosaicism rates. <laughs> uh -huh. <laughs> I can only uh, tell a speculative answer to this. Well, uh, we know that uh, if the embryo is uh, full aneuploid, and if we do extended culture, day seven and uh, uh, go so on, there is no uh, correction. Uh, this, uh, the same uh, rates stay the same. But for the mosaicism, I don't have, I don't know any study comparing the embryos for, with the day five or day seven, but logically there may be a decrease in mosaicism rate as the culture uh, conditions go on because of the self-correction of the embryo. So as time goes on, the number of aneuploid cells may decrease. This is my uh, theoretical answer, but I don't have no any study. Maybe Dr. Kovacic is aware of this. Uh, I also don't know such a study uh, maybe just a comment. We are talking about self-correction. Uh, <clears throat> maybe uh, 
at least if we read the last paper uh, as was cited uh, in my presentation from Giovanni Cotticcio, there is not only self-correction, there is also self-selection and self-elimination uh, among embryos. Uh, this is maybe some normal biological process in, uh, uh, in uh, uh, human embryo development, not only in in vitro, but also in vivo. So the embryos select uh, themselves by their chromosomal status. And uh, we can see if, if there is a higher level of uh, ano uh, anoploidies, uh, uh, uh, within an embryo, then it cannot uh, uh, progress its development. So uh, self-correction could be the, the first step, embryo try to self-correct uh, the situation, uh, then the embryo self-select uh, according to the speed of development and uh, try to, uh, to find the, try to reach the implantation window. And uh, if there are too many errors uh, within an embryo, they self-eliminate themselves by uh, arresting in development uh, and by starting uh, with apoptosis. Uh, so I would agree the, that uh, the seven embryos probably have uh, less mosaicism, but I don't know the study uh, that was done on that, that question. Okay. Uh... There is a question from Rudvan Sechkin. Considering 10% mosaicism level in trophectoderm cells, why don't we see at least 0.5% uh, mosaicism in, I, in NIPT results? Because NIPT, I think, is reflecting the results of the placenta, right? Yes. So, uh, because it is very obvious that uh, uh, this uh, first of all, 10% mosaicism in trophectoderm is a very, very low mosaicism and it is regarded as euploid. It is not uh, regarded in the mosaic range. Most laboratories, most uh, genetic laboratories report this as a euploid embryo, not mosaic embryo. Uh, it is uh, really a very, very low level of mosaicism. Uh, the cutoff limit for the most laboratories is less than 20%. So this is not most of for most laboratories. This is not considered as mosaic. And furthermore, when the page when the, uh, there is again self correction and the uh, loss of the aneuploid cells. So with the NIPT, uh, I, I'm sure we will have a normal euploid uh, constitution for such a case. Okay, my friends, dear colleagues. Unfortunately, we have to finish because time is up. First of all, I would like to thank to all speakers, to my friends, Jam Demiral and uh, Professor Borut Kovacic. We are also together in ISA, ISIVF as a board member. <laughs> yes. And then, uh, arkadaşlar, hepinize çok teşekkür ediyorum ve sevgilerimizi sunarak iyi geceler diliyoruz. Herkese iyi geceler. Thank you, Dr. Kovacic. Thank you. Thank you to both and thank you. Good night, everybody. Yes. Bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye.